Hello, everyone. My name is Emily Kuda, and I am Percona's Digital Marketing Manager. We'll begin in just a moment, but first I'd like to conduct a bit of housekeeping. First, please raise your hand using the hand icon located in the GoToWebinar control panel to let me know that you can hear me. Okay, great. Um, now, during this webinar, you will be on mute. Should you have any questions during the discussion, please enter them in the questions field within the control panel. At the end of the webinar, we will take time to answer as many questions as possible. Those that aren't addressed will be answered in a follow-up blog entry on Burkona's Data Performance blog. In addition, a recording of this webinar will be made available to everyone within 48 hours along with the slides. I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Compression and Open Source Databases, presented by Peter Zaitsev, CEO. With that said, I'll turn the floor over to Peter. Hey, uh, thanks, uh, Emily, for introduction. And uh, hello, uh, everyone, wherever time of day it, uh, it is in your uh, location. So uh, I'm very excited to uh, talk about compression uh, in the database because uh, during the uh, more than 15 years I was uh, involved in the industry, there have been a lot of changed changes uh, around uh, the, around this topic. So what we're going to talk about here is about three things. We'll talk about a bit of a history of compression. Uh, approaches to the data compression and uh, which uh, of those approaches some of the popular open source database systems uh, implement. So first let me define the term. What I'm going to mean here by uh, compression because uh, uh, it, it may be a little bit non-standard, right? To make it simple for me, I'll refer to compression as anything, uh, any technique which uh, makes the data, star, uh, data size uh, smaller. Right. So if you look at the, uh, at the history, uh, well, really, if uh, you look at the uh, history of compression way back, going back to the 70s and 80s, early computers were really uh, too slow to be able to implement any meaningful uh, data in the software. So at that time, we had uh, uh, compression implemented in the hardware. You know, some may remember those, let's say, backup tape, which would have some pretty weak compression implemented in the hardware, but that worked better than a software compression because uh, CPUs were so slow we couldn't really uh, handle it. And then uh, what uh, has been uh, happening gradually is uh, compression first appeared for non-performance critical data. Right, so then, uh, when it comes to databases or, uh, or file systems, so if uh, that's non-performance critical, we really access that. We may uh, able to uh, uh, compress the data. Now, it's worth to note though that we didn't really need compression uh, that much for uh, about 30 years. Right, you can see this graph, which is actually using the log scale. And you can see as from the early ages to 2010, uh, we had the cost per gigabyte dropped, uh, uh, what is it, uh, eight orders of magnitude, right, from about million dollar per gigabyte to uh, less than one cent in 2010, right, and even a little bit uh, uh, better today, right? So then uh, your hard drive's capacity is growing so quickly, uh, why do you need compression, right? Well, now when you come to a modern age, a few other things uh, uh, have happened. First, is the data growth really outpaces uh, hard uh, drive's uh, improvements in terms of capacity. And I'm not sure whatever we call it, the Moore's Law uh, or something else uh, for hard drives, but uh, we can see what it has been running out of steam. And you can see what for the uh, for last uh, few years, we're not really getting hard drives which are much larger, right? We kind of go through maybe three terabytes uh, hard drive size to uh, 10 terabytes tops, right? Which uh, is by far slow improvement level than ever before. At the same time, we get the modern CPUs which are Mm, quite uh, powerful, right? And they can handle 
a lot of compression and they have uh, uh, typically many cores to spare. Now we have flash, uh, we have cloud and uh, we have uh, also changes in terms of what data do we store. Now and let's look at that in more details. Now if you look at the data uh, from uh, about the EMC's research in digital universe and you can find very similar graphs with uh, uh, maybe different numbers but the uh, same trends which shows uh, what uh, we, we have uh, seen the exponential growth of the data uh, we have in what's called digital universe uh, and uh, it's expected to continue on this exponential uh, scale at least uh, until 2020. And we can see from this graph that actually a relatively small portion of that is, is going to be structured data, right? And uh, I think it's pretty clear, right? What a lot of data we produce, like uh, uh, videos or photos, right? Uh, uh, they are not structured and they take a lot of space. But it is going to be many, many uh, zettabytes of uh, structured data, the data we store in databases as well, right? And what is interesting uh, is what unstructured data such as videos or pictures, it is compressed and it has been compressed for a very long time while database content may not necessarily be so. Our CPUs, they are both uh, high performance and have uh, multiple cores and let's see how powerful they actually mm, are. These are the data for the single core uh, performance of uh, not the most modern CPU, I think it's uh, i5 uh, something. And, uh, and you can see uh, what uh, uh, compression speeds for uh, some of the uh, fastest uh, compression algorithm uh, closing in one on a gigabyte a second per core uh, and uh, the decompression uh, speed can be as much as uh, two or three megabytes, which is just a little bit slower than uh, MemCVY, right, which simply means uh, no compression at all and uh, or uh, copy in memory. At the same time, what I want you to see from this table is what you also have to choose compression algorithm wisely, because there is a huge, huge difference uh, between them. For example, uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, TokuDB, we offer both LZMA compression, compression as well as Zlib and the uh, QuickLZ, which is uh, performance-wise very close to LZ4. And you guys can see what uh, there is almost uh, 50 times compression and decompression difference, uh, speed difference between those two algorithms, right? So if you really choose their uh, compression wrong, uh, you, you may uh, get a very poor performance and get to a conclusion what compression doesn't uh, work uh, for your workload while what actually happened is you simply chose their own uh, compression level. Uh, you can also check out the link uh, above. Uh, it has a much higher, selec uh, larger selection of different compressions with different uh, levels. I just uh, picked a few. So. Uh, the next, I think, important thing is flash or solid-state drives, which probably is a better name, uh, as well as uh, some other uh, technologies beyond uh, flash starts to appear on a horizon. What is interesting about those uh, flash technologies is what disk space is much more costly than uh, this for uh, uh, for hard drive. We are often uh, going to pay, uh, you know. 50 cents, right, or maybe even a dollar for per gigabyte of storage on uh, high-performance flash. Uh, writing endurance is uh, <clears throat> is expensive, so we also want to write uh, less data, uh, cost consideration aside. And what is also interesting about flash is what it is actually quite decent handling fragmentation, right? Because from design standpoint, one of the big concerns uh, for, uh, with uh, compression in file systems or databases is uh, what that produces fragmentation because as you simply uh, rewrite, uh, rewrite the same block uh, it may not uh, may have a different compression properties. Cloud is also very uh, interesting for compression. In the cloud we are actually paying for space so while previously we may be buying uh, the storage 
right, uh, as a fixed uh, capital expense, uh, like you buy the hard drive, and then, frankly, until you use it, uh, you don't really care how much uh, space you use it that much, right? It's only when it's 100% full you have to uh, uh, to buy uh, buy more. But in the cloud, you're actually paying for the space you use. And uh, if you uh, happen to to be able to compress your database uh, to take half a space, you can reduce your storage-related uh, cloud bills uh, in half. You also store for pay for IOPS, so writing less data and reading less data is uh, is helpful. And what is also interesting is compared to a lot of custom designed uh, systems uh, in your own data center, you typically are going to be more limited in storage performance and uh, and network performance, which also goes towards compression. Now let's look at the data. What kind of data we often deal with in a modern systems when it comes to uh, structured data. We are dealing with a lot of texts, right, uh, which we uh, produce both as people both, uh, as well as machines also often like to communicate in a text in a readable format, so we produce a lot of text. Uh, some mm, structured formats which we often store in databases such as JSON and XML both compress pretty well. We have time series data, which also compress extremely well, especially if you use some special purpose uh, algorithms and log files. All of those data which are stored in modern database compress uh, very, very well. Sometimes you can get uh, a compression of a 10x or even more with those kinds of data. So now let's look at compression basics. And uh, introductions, what are ways exist out there to make your data smaller? First, there are really two big classes of compression algorithms. One of them are called, uh, called lossy. This is, uh, for example, a JPEG compression, which does not really represent exactly the same as a regional picture, picture but it uh, pretty much looks the same. And the other is lossless. This is compression where when you uncompress the data, it's exactly the same as uh, uh, it has been uh, uh, original, right, and before. Now, when it comes to databases, databases generally use lossless compression because one of the properties we want from a database is if you put the data in it and then you read that data back, then you read back the data which is exactly the same, right, which doesn't leave a lot of room for lossy compression. At the same time, lossy compression can often be done on the application level when we use, uh, use databases, right, if that's uh, uh, something appropriate. So what kind of uh, ways do we can get to make data uh, smaller, right, or what you call the compression here? These are a few things such as layout optimization, encoding dictionary compression, and uh, the block compression. When you speak about layout optimizations, we are simply thinking about how exactly can we store data which is more efficient on itself or maybe help us to compress the data more effectively. For example, in a database, uh, we have a column store and row stores. And a column store which uh, store uh, values of the same column among uh, many rows uh, close to each other, they generally compress uh, much, much better, uh, better than a row store. There are also some hybrid formats uh, uh, exist, or uh, some storage engines may use a variable block sizes, which help uh, to uh, improve the compression uh, uh, compression size. I saw even some more uh, advanced uh, compression uh, technologies, like uh, one of the systems I see, which is designed for storing time series. It would uh, essentially in uh, encode some of the data which is shared across a whole rows in a time series in the uh, in the header and uh, then simply uh, repeat it across all, uh, all the data when uh, required. Uh, encoding, this is something which is very dependent on the data type and uh, what's called a domain or how that data is using. This could be things like a delta encoding or write time length encoding. Uh, what is interesting about the, those encoding uh, approaches it can actually be faster than a uh, read of uh, uncompressed data alone because uh, encoding often is so simple 
the uh, CPUs can uh, process that faster than a one bit of memory uh, available. There are some other examples you can see. For 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 example, uh, UTF-8 is essentially the uh, encoding format for uh, uh, for UTF, which otherwise would uh, uh, take you know several bytes or for each character, right? If, even if it's a commonly used uh, ASCII character, VLQ that is uh, a, the, the similar idea for uh, encoding. Uh, integers of arbitrary length, right? So if you uh, have your data which mostly fits in eight uh, bit uh, integers, but sometimes you go as much uh, as 64 bit or even 128, uh, that may be an interesting um, type of encoding. And the one which is a very popular in the databases is uh, index prefix compression, right? Where we can compare, uh, can uh, essentially encode the index structure on the page. Uh, which uh, becomes uh, a lot uh, a lot smaller than otherwise. Uh, dictionary compression that is another a simple approach, which uh, uh, is essentially replacing frequent values with a dictionary pointer. For those of us who are C programmers, we can uh, really think about that as an STL string, right? We're the same string. Uh, uh, used throughout the uh, different places and applications will actually be represented only one space in memory and uh, others will simply have a pointer uh, on the an RF count. Another uh, dictionary compression example is a num type in MySQL. You can have very long values for those uh, uh, in enum field, but what MySQL will actually store physically in the table is uh, uh, just their uh, the, the uh, value, right? Uh, the number of of a value which uh, which you are storing. Finally, let us talk about the block compression, which is probably uh, the most conventional uh, type of compression which is available in a lot of databases. Um, the idea here is uh, pretty simple. We take the blo a block of data, such as database page. And we uh, uh, compress it by some finding the patterns in the data and effectively encoding them. And for those, typically we use some sort of traditional algorithms: Snappy, Zlib, LZ4, LZMA, right, and others. Now, what is worth to mention is what those ideas. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be one or another. It is perfectly fine for a system to use uh, multiple uh, database compression methods to uh, achieve the best efficiency. Now, what we should know about uh, block compression details. First is uh, there is no really one compression rate. It's going to highly depend uh, uh, on the data. In some cases, you uh, can get a data which is barely compressible at all. And uh, in others, you may have a data which compre uh, compresses very much. Another thing, uh, you should know what the compression rates depend on the block size, right? The more, uh, the larger is the block size, which uh, is being compressed, right? And each block size typically compresses individually in the databases. The better, mm, uh, the lower uh, compression rate you're going to get. And you should also know what for many uh, compression algorithms, the speed, such as I shared with you in a table uh, before is not something which is fi which is fixed. It also may depend uh, on the block size and the data. This is uh, is example which I uh, took for presentation by by uh, Lee Falsch, right? Where he mentioned uh, he looked at the mm, compression performance of the different uh, different block sizes, and you see as the idea from uh, uh, from this is what on the last uh, larger blocks, the data compresses better, uh, better even though uh, uh, gradually uh, the, the block improvement size starts to mm, matter less, right? And for this kind of data and for uh, this compression algorithm, we can see what a block size of 128K, uh, which uh, is uh, where we are starting to, get, starting to get close to the optimal compression. 
Now, what is interesting in this case is that there are no compression algorithms for block size uh, which uh, fits at all. Right? Depending on the data, we have a, may have a different needs for compression, decompression performance. And also, there are typically trade-offs for choosing the large block size. Right? Because uh, what uh, uh, happens with block compression is we typically have to, comp uh, to, to read the data, we, oh, we have to uncompress uh, the block completely. So if you have a block size which is, for example, one megabyte in size and we just have to read uh, 10 uh, bytes somewhere in the middle, we'll have to uncompress a whole one megabyte of data, which is going to be uh, quite expensive compared to reading those 10 uh, bytes of data straight from uh, from uncompressed memory. Okay, so now let's talk about the other question, is where exactly the compression uh, happens and how it happens. There are a few locations where you can compress the data. Uh, in, uh, in database uh, memory, right, as a part of a database uh, store, so when database stores the data, compresses the data before it writes it to a file, as a part of a file system, storage hardware, or uh, maybe an application even. Now, compression in memory helps us because we can reduce the amount of memory needed for the same working set. Right? Uh, this is on the, uh, on the positive side. Uh, uh, and we also can reduce the amount of I.O. which is needed uh, for the same amount of memory. But the problem here is what uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, overhead, uh, right? Because typically accessing uh, memory is very fast, and having to decompress some blocks uh, uh, can be cause very severe performance uh, impact. This is why, in majority of cases, when we speak about the um, compression in memory, we either have something like uh, encoding and decoding. Uh, or dictionary compression uses which are pretty light and doesn't co cost a lot of CPU overhead or we may have like two different levels of caching in a database where the hottest accessed pages are, are uncompressed and only uh, not so hot pages are kept in memory compressed. What about compressing data in a database data store? Well, that helps us to reduce the database size uh, uh, on disk and it is good because it works with all uh, uh, file system and storage formats. It's also good because it can play together with a database size encryption. There, if you would uh, uh, try to use file system compression or uh, storage device compression, uh, it wouldn't work with encrypted database be because uh, even uncompressible data, even if well compressible data becomes uncompressible when it's encrypted. Uh, now, what is interesting in, the, in this case is uh, if you are uh, looking for in-memory compression, you can often get that uh, if you are using uh, operating and system cache to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to cache for data. For example, for some workloads with TocoDB storage engine, we select TocoDB cache uh, being relatively small and allocate much more memory for uh, operating system cache allowing us to cache the compressed uh, TocoDB uh, data which is stored in files uh, and uh, as such as low, much larger uh, portion of a database being uh, cached. Well, the, the thing to note about the database data store level compression is what it has to deal with, uh, uh, with fragmentation as a pretty, uh, pretty common issue. Compression on the file system level has different benefits. It works with all database and storage engines, right? Uh, you can take any database which has nothing to, does not know anything about compression and run it on file system, which uh, uh, has a compression such as ZFS or uh, ButterFS or uh, file system which is built in some uh, Sun or NAS uh, storage solution. Well, the problem in this case uh, is twofold. The first is Performance impact can be significant because file systems don't have as much information about database access per, uh, pattern. We can't really employ the all optimizations database could. And also logical space on disk is not uh, uh, reduced in this case. And why is that a problem is, well, for example, if I want to copy uh, 
database, let's say from one file compressed file system to another over network, well, uh, the chances are I'll have to uncompress it, copy in uncompressed way, or recompress it again for copying through network, right? Which wouldn't be as uh, as efficient. Compression on storage hardware is uh, pretty much hardware dependent, uh, and uh, it doesn't really reduce the space on on disk uh, it, in the in uh, in many cases. Uh, when it can be actually helpful, well, for a number of solid state system drives, they internally have compression before they store the data, uh, which allows them to have uh, uh, to reduce the wear as well as have more space available when they do garbage collection. Uh, in the same case, that can uh, both give us performance gains as well as sometimes a very intensive writes that uh, compression on the SSD can, can become a choke point. Right, so uh, if you are using SSD which has some internal compression, you want to be watching that carefully. Compression application. Well, uh, we have done uh, in many cases something like uh, taking a large XML document and compressing that before stacking that in a MySQL uh, blob, right? And the nice thing about this, there is no database support needed. And uh, we not only reduce the database load, which doesn't need to do compression anymore, but also uh, network traffic, right? Uh, and uh, what, what is also nice is what the application knows more about data, so it knows what data to compress and how to compress it. This is all nice, but at the same time, it comes at the additional cost of application complexity. And that also means that we have to give up many database features we love them for. For example, if I have compressed uh, uh, XML before stacking that in database, well, uh, I can no more use uh, the, any kind of index, right, or database functions to work with, uh, uh, with the data. Now let's uh, talk about some uh, other design considerations. What databases do to implement compression well? The goal, really, for compression is to minimize the negative impact for user operations, reads and writes, right? I think that's uh, uh, as much uh, clear. Uh, the design principles goes typically as following. Uh, we are using the algorithms which have a fast decompression, which is pretty important because when they go, when user requests the data which happens to be compressed right now, it must be decompressed in real time. We cannot give a uh, user response until that uh, uh, compression has, uh, decompression has completed. Uh, compression needs to happen in the background, uh, at, le at least the uh, more uh, you know, complicated one, right? And typically that's possible with, uh, because as we take the data in, we don't really need that to be uh, compressed uh, instantly. That database can do on its later. Database should implement a parallel for uh, compression, decompression, because we have so many CPUs core right now. And also, we're typically leading for something called uh, re, uh, 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 reducing the recompression and update. We don't want to constantly uh, uh, recompress the large blocks of data, even when we're doing some minor change. That would be mm, pretty expensive. Now, for block size, uh, we also have to choose uh, the, what we want. Large blocks give us uh, their most efficient compression, and they are very efficient for bulky writes as well as uh, large uh, sequential scans. But at the same time, if you're looking for mostly point lookups operations, then we often have to uh, use smaller blocks. Now let's talk about a few uh, database implementation examples. First, uh, MySQL packed by some. In the MySQL space, that is probably the earliest example of uh, some sort of compression uh, used. Uh, the idea is what you will compress table offline with uh, special utility MySQL pack. Table becomes uh, read-only, but uh, uh, it would employ a uh, variety of uh, compression uh, me uh, methods, mostly a simple one. Um, 
uh, to get that uh, table compressed. In this method, only the data is compressed and uh, uh, and uh, not uh, not the indexes. While for indexes, you can uh, enable prefix compression in uh, in my sum uh, if you like. This is kind of a uh, early example of a compression implementation, which uh, worked pretty well in MySQL, though I haven't seen much of a packed MySQL, MySAM used in uh, uh, recent years. Uh, the next uh, uh, compression implementation attempt in MySQL was through archive storage engine, right? And archive storage engine uh, essentially was designed for uh, login, right? You can write data to that, it becomes instantly compressed using zlib compression and archive storage engine does not support indexes so it was only good for uh, full table scan so that really limited um, its uh, its usefulness right because if you only can have a full table scan well that is not really a very database thing to do next uh, comes in a db table compression and in a DB table compression was available now for a while since MySQL 5.1. We have a pages which are uh, compressed uh, page by page using uh, uh, zlib. Uh, additionally, uh, out of uh, of page externally stored blobs uh, can be uh, compressed as a sing single entry, right? Even if it takes uh, takes many pages. Uh, the change, uh, challenge with InnoDB compression, which I think is quite uh, unusual, is what you sort of have to choose how you will think your data will compress by choosing compression page size. And if you uh, guess wrong, then you have a very bad performance with, uh, with compression, right? So that is something that you have to be kept in mind. Uh, some other design considerations for InnoDB is what InnoDB uh, actually uh, caps both compressed and uncompressed page, uh, pages in the buffer pool. And in certain cases it may uh, throw away the, uh, the uh, uncompressed pages, uh, the compressed pages if their uh, sort of CPU pressure become too large. Also in a DB uh, compression maintains some sort of little log on, uh, on the page of the changes to avoid what I mentioned as a constant compression, uh, constant uh, recompression of pages, even when you updated just one or two rows. Now, in NDB implements another type of compression, starting from MySQL 5.7, and it is called transparent page, uh, page compression. This is much more uh, simple from the NDB side approach to compression. Instead of implementing this kind of complicated fitting of the pages and picking how they will compress, we essentially trying to compress the page uh, as much as we do. Some pages com uh, compress well, some don't. And as the pages are written uh, on the disk, uh, the, uh, we see how much space on the page became unused uh, after uh, the content was compressed. And we are using a hole punching uh, to tell the file system what that space is not really used. It was originally developed to work with Fusion IO and the MFS file system, but actually it uh, works with a re a re recent Linux kernels on on variety of file systems. But this uh, approach looks uh, absolutely ingenious in practice, but uh, there are some issues with that as well. As Mark Callaghan reported, uh, in many cases, uh, modern file systems don't really like to have uh, one hole per every 16 kilobytes of storage. And uh, their performance with such uh, 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 such uh, files with so many holes often can be uh, significantly reduced, right? So, if you're planning to roll out this compression, taste it carefully. These are some of our uh, uh, data from benchmarks by uh, Sunny Baines, where we can see what uh, from compression uh, idea of a new compression. Uh, gets a little bit lower compression rate than an uh, old one for uh, a given data set. And, uh, but in terms of performance, it uh, it's, uh, behaves much, much better than all compression, which can, uh, which uh, really introduce a lot of compre uh, complexity in data handling. And we can see what if you uh, have uh, uh, IO-bound workloads on a very uh, slow 
drive, you can actually get even uh, better performance from new compression uh, than uh, you get uh, from uncompressed storage, right? So mm, some ideas. Now the next storage engine uh, we can cover is uh, its uh, compression and fra fractal tree storage engines, which is uh, Pircon FT in MongoDB or TopoDB in uh, in MySQL. Right. Uh, this storage engine can use uh, many compression libraries, and uh, we are uh, adding uh, more uh, as we find different use cases for uh, compression. Uh, this storage engine has a tunable um, compression block size, and uh, it uh, has uh, also uh, pretty a lot of work done to reduce recompression needs because uh, because of. Uh, 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 how it is uh, is designed. This is stor storage engines which we uh, as uh, Pircona uh, develop and, uh, and maintain. Uh, the good thing about the uh, TokuDB is what you can get a lot of compression. If the data compresses very well, you can get uh, uh, a compression rate uh, of uh, 10x or even even smaller. This is uh, it, the example for a very, very well compressible data, right? So your mileage will vary, but uh, uh, that is a very uh, major advantage for uh, for MySQL, and uh, it is a good uh, compression-friendly storage engine which uh, has support for uh, for transactions as well. Another storage engine to cover is MongoDB Wire Tiger. Wire Tiger has really uh, very many compression settings. Not all of them are actually enabled in the uh, in the DB uh, in uh, in MongoDB itself, right? If you look at the uh, Wire Tiger manual, it has uh, uh, dictionary compressions for data on pages and Huffman compression and so on and so forth. Now, uh, two uh, important things to uh, uh, which are of a practical uh, helpfulness for MongoDB users is. Uh, uh, what uh, indexes uh, in MongoDB wire tigers uh, are compressed uh, using index prefix compression, right? And the data pages can be compressed using uh, one of the several compression libraries, such as Zlib, uh, ilz4, or, or, or Snappy, right? So uh, the, the new wire tiger can offer you pretty good uh, compression rate. These are a result by uh, Isaac uh, Kamsky comparing wire tiger with MF1, and you can see what MF1 was pretty um, well uh, verbose, if you like, right? Database store, right? The, the wire tiger was almost twice smaller, even with no compression. But with compression enabled, it can be uh, 10x or more smaller than MMAP. So if you're still using MMAP with a um, a storage engine with MongoDB, I would start exploring either uh, Wire Tiger or uh, Pircon FT storage engine. The next storage engine to look at uh, is RocksDB. This is also a very interesting storage engine be uh, because uh, it is an LSM based, uh, so that's a different data structure than the uh, B3, which is used by most other storage engines. Uh, and it's available for MongoDB as mm, MongoRox and for MySQL as MyRox. And the great thing about uh, LSM, it really works very, very well uh, uh, with, uh, mm, uh, with compression uh, because it's uh, really focused about uh, with a data which is uh, uh, written uh, only, only once, right? So we don't have a problem of uh, compression, which we, we can compress it uh, using the optimal block sizes and so on and so forth. Another thing about RocksDB, it supports different le different types of compression. And what I think is a very uh, interesting here is what it can use uh, different le compression uh, level uh, compression levels or compression mesh for different levels in LSM3. That means if you're kind of uh, level zero, level one, which are often kind of churned, you may choose not to have any compression on that at all, and then your uh, max LSM level, you may use some compression which is expensive to compress but fast to decompress because data written in that level uh, is unlikely to be uh, ever written. 
So uh, if you look uh, at some other results, which is die, uh, done by Mike uh, from uh, PARS, the Facebook company, uh, we have seen uh, even better uh, compression with frogs DB than the wire tiger. But I think uh, in both cases you can see what the, this is close to order of magnitude so smaller than MF1, right? So uh, I think that's the main uh, difference here. Now let's look at uh, at the Postgres mm, storage engine. Now Postgres actually have certain compression which is uh, mm, enabled uh, with uh, technology called Toast, which is enabled by uh, default. And uh, what that means is what by default uh, the longer strings or blobs taking more than 2K in size are going uh, to be compressed uh, as they store. Unlike in NDB, you don't need to uh, have a part of a string of blob to be stored externally from a page for it to be considered for, uh, for compression. Now, if you are looking for the uh, other uh, for compression for other data in Postgres, you right now are recommended to use a file system compression like uh, ZFS, uh, uh, for example. Uh, it doesn't have any uh, built-in uh, compression and standard distribution uh, as of yet. So if you look at the summary, uh, the compression is pretty more important in a modern age, and uh, I suggest you to consider that for, for your system. There may be some uh, important performance gains or cost savings to be delivered by uh, using uh, compression. Uh, if you need any help uh, with uh, the, uh, those decisions, uh, talk to us at your corner. We're happy to uh, uh, help you. And you can see what there are many different technologies uh, are used by the databases to uh, to make the data smaller. The last point here is what support is, uh, compression support is really rapidly changing. I think it's uh, uh, really picked up during the last five years due to the changes uh, uh, in the industry I mentioned. And the compression support you're looking now may be very different from what are going to exist uh, three years from now. So. Uh, make sure you keep uh, watching and revising this topic. If you want to hear more about MySQL, about the compression, and uh, other topics about MongoDB and uh, other open source uh, database, we welcome you to Percona Live taking place in Santa Clara uh, in, uh, in April. And uh, I'm happy to share you the discount code to get some discount for, as a thanks for attending this webinar. Uh, at this point, I would be happy to take some questions. Okay. Emily, are you there? Okay, well that's uh, 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 that's unusual. Let me see if I. Uh... Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Oh yes, yes. Okay, there so we go. Mute button, right? Sorry yes, about that's that. it. Um, so yeah, um, go ahead and please enter your questions in the control panel now. Um, if we cannot get to your questions today, there will be a follow-up blog post answering your questions. Um, so the first question um, for you, Peter, is. What do you think of Oracle's columnar compression? What do you have about uh, Oracle's uh, columnar compression? Well, uh, frankly, I uh, haven't looked at uh, uh, many commercial databases uh, out there. I know what the compression test is implemented in many uh, in many commercial databases. Um, if you generally look at the column-based store, right, it's uh, typically is uh, able to employ much better uh, compression rate uh, compared to the row store such as uh, InnoDB, TokuDB, right, and, uh, and some others, uh, uh, but uh, at the cost of, of uh, updates, right? So the column uh, level storage engines are typically designed for uh, analytical workloads, not for your transactional databases. 
Okay, um, next one, does compression affect the row size error? Does compression uh, affect uh, row size error? Uh, well, uh, it's not very clear what uh, a person is asking about, but I guess uh, if you're talking about the uh, in a DB, then the answer is uh, is no. Uh, if uh, com compression happens on the database level, then row size is validated before uh, the and compression happens on the low level. At the same time, if you're doing some compression on the application level, then by compressing some data, you can uh, avoid the uh, row size error issues. How about post gastral compression? How uh, I don't understand this question. I mean, can you? Uh, sure, I'm going to spell it out. Um, P O S T G R E S Q Y Q L. Post guest S Q L. Oh, for post uh, post guest. Oh yeah, that's uh, uh, th that's uh, tricky. Well, uh, I, I what I have uh, uh, if you're looking at post guest, that I guess that's a post guest related. So uh, uh, that. Uh, as uh, I have looked uh, uh, at into that, I uh, mainly looked into the general compression for uh, Postgres, uh, for Postgres, right? Which uh, seems to be based on, on the strings mostly. I uh, I don't know about the Postgres compression, but you uh, a uh, you uh, feel free to drop me a note, uh, and uh, we can talk about that in more detail. So okay. Um... What is the compression DB um, used in MySQL? Compression well, database used in, in MySQL. Yes, that's a, I'm uh, I'm trying to understand what uh, that, uh, that question uh, what that com com question means, right? If you uh, in MySQL compression is uh, is going to be defined by the storage engine levels. So typically, all the storage level, uh, engines, uh, my, uh, like MySQL or TocoDB or uh, Archive, they would support uh, Zelib. Some of them support some other compression uh, as well, ranging from uh, fast, such as LZ4, to, uh, to something like uh, LZMA, which is uh, kind of very powerful but slow compression. Okay, um, how does index prefix compression work? Okay, okay, yeah, that is, that is a very good uh, question. So, uh, think about how indexes, uh, uh, what the index is, right? Uh, it uh, uh, really provides us the mapping between the, the key uh, in the index and the value, which is essentially a row pointer uh, in most cases. And uh, the thing about the key is what they are sorted, right? So, for example, if you have an index on a name, there would be a uh, name such as uh, Anna, then followed by Annabelle, and so on and so forth, right? And maybe some others point in the other direction. What prefix compression does, it notices what the Anne and Annabelle shares the, share the same prefix. So instead of storing the Annabelle completely, we will store the number saying, hey, uh, number three because there are three characters, right, uh, uh, which are the same as the previous value, and then the other uh, uh, the other data, right? In a lot of cases, uh, that can uh, provide us a very uh, substantial uh, compression if the indexes share in index keys share a lot of prefixes. Now the downside of that is. Um, how we can look for data inside the page, right? Because, uh, because if you think uh, the, uh, when you're doing a row lookup in uh, in many databases, what happens is first you use a B3 to find the proper page on the disk. And then you're going to look on the page and find the proper value on that, uh, on that page. And this is not done by a page scanning because that would be expensive. It is done instead of using something as a B3 search, right? And the problem here is what you cannot really do a B3 search on the compressed uh, prefix data because you have to uh, know to what you correspond, right? So you have to implement some special techniques for uh, 
to handle that optimally, right? Or you may need actually to, to give up your uh, bit research in a page and actually scan it from a uh, from a startup page to find what the uh, what the data is. Uh, this uh, actually the complexity which uh, prefix compression comes for for searching the large pages for a reverse scan on the indexes is the reason why InnoDB doesn't implement the prefix compression as of yet. Okay, um, our next question is, given the interest in compression, what is your take on the impact of denormalization results in data being repeated throughout a database? Well, uh, like generalized uh, data actually is uh, is very common as a performance optimization a trick, right? For, uh, to, for for certain workloads, and uh, uh, denormalized data often compresses better, uh, better, much better, right? Because it is significantly repetitive. But at the same time, I wouldn't see as uh, the compression as ability to sort of shrink your database back to the normalized uh, form, size-wise, right? It's the denormalized data, even compressed, is quite likely to be much larger than your original data. So um, I'm going to um, combine this one. Is TokuDB um, uh, affects the data in the database? Well, uh, yes. Yeah, so that TokuDB is a different store, uh, storage engine compared to in the DB, right? So if you're storing uh, data in, uh, in in TokuDB, your data on disk is going to be stored differently compared to uh, to in a DB storage engine. But at the same time, uh, the uh, logically uh, your data should be stored the same, and it also supports most of the same features what InnoDB supports, the most important uh, 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 transactions. So in a lot of cases, you can migrate from InnoDB to TopoDB without the application changes. OK. And then I'm going to do my best to um, hopefully I have all the pieces here. Um, my current environment consists of a buy environment, which I do not load at each end of the month. I would like to be able to quickly load and unload months which would be the best approach to do this. I was thinking about instead of triggers and unified table views to quickly compress without logging and safely. Well, uh, the, that, is a, the, that is a long question, right? I think uh, in this case where uh, the, the answer may, uh, may worry, uh, really, right? From what I understand and what may be interesting feature to explore, is the partitions. In MySQL, now you can uh, load partitions, right? And then you can, uh, in uh, MySQL 5.7, uh, you can uh, the essentially extract the one partition from the data, uh, from, a, uh, from a server, and move that in a physical form to the other server or to archive, which can be uh, pretty convenient if you, uh, for example, have to only keep a three months worth of data uh, in the online database and uh, then move it to archive or something like that. Um, okay, and then we'll sneak in another one. What would happen if we use TMP underscore storage underscore engine as TokuDB? Well, uh, oh, honestly, uh, the I I don't know the answer, right? But I would say what uh, uh, the TokuDB wasn't designed in this case to serve as a MySQL uh, a internal storage engine, and uh, we wouldn't recommend that. At the same time, if you just want to create the application level uh, temporary uh, storage engines as TokuDB, that is supported. Okay, um, so at Looks like we're actually getting close to the end of our webinar. Um, 
And we actually um, have answered all of our questions. So thank you so much um, for Peter for presenting today's webinar called Compression in Open Source Databases. Um, I want to remind everybody that um, at the end of the webinar, we will be sending out a recording of this webinar along with the slides in 48 hours. Um, so uh, keep an eye out for that in your um, emails today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emily.